uh, managed to win Rookie of the Year that year, which is a big deal because it's the only thing you get one shot at doing. Yeah. Um, got a driver from great teams, Newman Haas, Andretti Autosport, Schmidt Peterson, which is now McLaren. Mm-hmm. Um, won a handful of races, uh, six races, a couple podiums at my hometown race in Toronto, which is always cool. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, pole at the Indianapolis 500 for the 100th running back in 2016 is another, another big highlight. And then hung up the helmet at the end of 21 and uh, picked up a microphone instead. So here we are. Hey everyone, welcome to the Track Limits Podcast. We are presented by Formula Addict. We're here in St. Petersburg in Florida for the first IndyCar race of the season. Very, very exciting. I'm your host, Swish. I'm here with Henny and oh. Mikey. And today we're here with one of the most recognizable faces in the yeah. Indy circuit, both as a racer and a commentator. <laughs> Welcome, James Hinchcliffe. Welcome. Thank you so much, guys. Appreciate you having me. Yeah, of course. Thanks for being here. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, how are you doing, though? So, hey, first race of the season, man. I'm, I'm, I'm jazzed. I'm jazzed. Let's go. I'm, I, we always wait for this one, right? Everyone's so excited to get here. It's such a good event, anyway. Yep. Uh, here in St. Pete. So, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. It's a, yeah, it was actually funny because we went the wrong way yeah. when we were coming here, and we just saw we went the through all thing. the track or like where all the cars were parked. We're like, oh my god, this is so cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Behind the scenes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. mega access. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 What if we did the interview here? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like right outside. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, yeah. throughout the course of kind of the next 30, 40 minutes, we're going to go through three parts. This Q1, all the questions related to racing. Um, this Q2, which is a little bit more personal questions, trying to get to know you as a professional. And then finally, is the rapid fire. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Purple Very sectors excited. only. Right. That's, yeah. a, that's right, all we're right, allowed. Yeah, yeah. We are like, going to be I like the format. Yeah. 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 Guaranteed to get into Q3. I like exactly. It. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we, we okay. had some guests, you know, yeah. they were like, on yeah. that border. After Q1, it's like, yeah. we're done. We're done. All right. Well, let's get right into it. Q1, first question we ask every guest. For in about 30 seconds, can you summarize your career for us? I know it might be tough, but Ooh. some of the core accomplishments you're proud about. In 30 seconds. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, um, you know, everything before IndyCar doesn't really matter. So <laughs> oh, debuted in IndyCar in 2011, uh, managed to win Rookie of the Year that year, which is a big deal because it's the only thing you get one shot at doing. Yep. Um, got a driver from great teams, Newman Haas, Andretti Autosport, Schmidt Peterson, which is now McLaren. Mm-hmm. Um, won a handful of races, uh, six races, a couple podiums at my hometown race Woo! in Toronto, which is Amazing. always cool. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, pole at the Indianapolis 500 for the 100th running back in 2016 is another another big highlight. And then hung up the helmet at the end of 21 and uh, picked up a microphone instead. So here huh. we are. Look at that. <laughs> and then what does the day-to-day life for you now look like? It depends on the day. Yeah. I mean, yeah. what, what yeah. time of year are we talking? Yeah. If it's, you know, in January, it's yeah. pretty relaxed. I'm not going to lie to you. But right. uh, no, once we get into the season, it's, um, you know, if we're in a race week, you know, we have a uh, big production, pre-production meeting day on Tuesdays. It's, um, you know, Zoom calls with people from NBC, people from IndyCar, things like that, sort of preparing. You're going through last year's races. You know, Wednesdays, I'll spend time going through old videos, look through old races. Then Thursday, you normally travel to the races. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, you know, you're at the track doing your thing. And uh, we, we brought broadcast every session uh, on on Peacock through to Sunday and then Sunday obviously on uh, on NBC most of the races um, which is pretty cool had everything up on network and yeah so it's it's big then you get home you fly home Monday and you know Tuesday your production meeting starts for the next week so it's it's pretty it's pretty full on and I filled my off weekends with doing some other other commentary now I do some Mm -hmm. IMSA races I do some F1 stuff now congrats on that we just heard that I appreciate it so it's yeah gonna be a busy summer yeah yeah Yeah. and then I mean this was by the way one of the most requested interviews oh really I'll tell you this a couple of my friends in Toronto they're obsessed with Indy and they love you oh yeah they they love you because I think a lot of the commentary also comes from a racer's point of view right which is really cool to see when it you know when you take a look at passion and i think you've now been in the sport for for over a decade yeah what keeps you passionate about motorsport i i don't know why you wouldn't be passionate yeah. about <laughs> I, I, that's you know i don't know how to answer cars, that yeah. question yeah, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. uh it's just to me it's it's such a unique sport um that that mastery of man and machine you know that balancing uh act uh keeping something on the edge of 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 adhesion of grip of control i guess in a lot of ways and it's taking this inanimate object in a race car and kind of breathing life into it and working together towards something i imagine it's what pilots feel like you know that are flying on fighter pilots things like that Mm -hmm. astronauts i don't know maybe (laughs) probably making us look a little cooler than we are (laughs) but i always said i've got a buddy who's who's an astronaut and i always said he's the only guy that could argue that he had a cooler job job than you so i really really looked up to this guy yeah um but yeah i mean it's it's just it's such an easy sport to fall in love with and i meet a lot of people that are kind of new to it because it's not the most prevalent sport in north america right but i meet people that either watch a race or especially come to a track for the first time 
and they leave lifelong fans. Yep. When you see it in person, it, it's just tough to be. It, that, that was us in yeah. Montreal Grand Prix last year. There you go. Yeah. This is why we started the podcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. literally, we came out of that and we're like, we need to do this. We yeah. do that. Yeah, we, we love it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. And then when it comes to the season in particular, what are you looking forward to the most now? You know, you've had a bit of commentary experience. You're obviously doing not just indie, but F1 as well. What are some of the things you're like really looking forward to checking off the bucket list? Well, I mean, last year was such a baptism of fire. You know, I, I got to do all these cool things, just move up to the booth in the first place. That's a that's a big transition, you know, for any athlete, any driver, any whatever. When you hang up the helmet, hang up the skates, hang up the whatever, and uh, and move into something else, it's always a little bit nerve wracking, a little bit daunting. But the group at NBC are just awesome, man. They made it so easy for me. You know, Diff and T Bell up in the booth with me are, are just the best and um i feel so, a lot more comfortable coming into this season with a year under my belt than i did 12 months ago and uh you know if, i've already called an indy 500 i've called two rolex 24s now i've done all this cool stuff already i'm just so lucky to get to do it at all you know and so um i'm just excited for another awesome season of indy car racing you know it, it, it's the hardest championship to predict mm-hmm. you know it's it's it, you can sit here and we could probably all guess within one or two spots who's going to be one two three in the f1 championship this yeah. year. Yeah, i'm yeah, sorry yeah, that's just that's yeah, just yeah, realistic yeah. Yeah. it's just reality yeah. right i couldn't give you the top 10 in any sort of you know, logical order i can mm. probably tell you who the top 10 are going to be plus or minus one yeah. but no chance at an order right you, you, 2021 champion alex polo no one saw that coming 2022 didn't win a, a race till the last race of the season yeah. like, it's just it's so competitive it's so unpredictable and that's what i love about this series so that's what i'm looking forward yeah. to this year it's just and, a lot a lot of it and you racing. know talking about the unpredictability of the sport what was your career like in indie series like what did you find challenging and how did you even overcome those challenges in your career uh, everything about indycar racing is yeah. challenging that's, that's the problem you know you have to be good at so many different disciplines yeah. right just just to be a good racing driver you have to be good at all the things racing drivers have to be good at yeah. but most other series race on one general type of circuit uh when you go from a road circuit to a street circuit to a super speedway to a short oval the skill set required for each of those is so different and learning how to kind of master each one of those is so so difficult and i think that's why when i look at who the champion is at the end of a season in indycar you can't help but just be super impressed with that effort because you've got to be consistently good week in week out over these four different disciplines that we have over an entire season and it's not just you obviously it's your whole team and everything that's that's involved in that so it's you know that's a big learning process i think when you first get to this level is knowing hey look it's not just one person behind the wheel right you this team of probably 20 people just on your car never mind if you're in a multi car team and you have to really learn how to kind of quarterback that group and and get everybody working together on the same page execute week in and week out on sundays and it's it's one of the most difficult things to do and what, what was your favorite win from your whole career Honestly, probably this one here yeah. in St. Mm-hmm. Pete um, mm-hmm. is the first one. You never forget your first. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's it was just such a it was such a like vindication, a justification for all the hard work, all the tears, all the heartache, all the up and down, the sacrifice, everything that went into it. Not just for me, but for my whole family, everybody that supported me, and and my my family was was all there that day. I got to you know be in victory lane with my parents, and wow. that's amazing. It was just it was such a special moment, man. And and you know we won a, a couple races after that, but for me that one always sort of stood out. I think think it would have taken toronto or the indy 500 to yeah. knock oh, st pete off the yeah, top yeah, yeah. yeah long beach is a close second because that's like the race everybody wants to win outside Wait. of indy you right, know yeah. long beach is super special and that one was special but that first one is always extra cool amazing um indy drivers like you're all known for like your mental and physical toughness like, how did you prepare in your off season just to handle like you just talked about the pressure that's involved yeah the, the, the pressure is a huge part of it you know this is such a mental game mm. right when you're when you're dealing in in hundreds and thousands of a second you have to be absolutely zoned in at all times and unlike most other sports you don't get to practice this in the off season right if you play hockey or soccer or football like whatever you if you there's a skill that you're lacking at and you want to perfect you can go spend time on that quarter in that rink mm-hmm. or whatever you want to do on that field we just don't get to do that in racing so one of the hardest challenges is like being able to just turn it on on a race weekend push yourself, try to improve, but also in a controlled enough way that you don't hit the wall. Cause if you lose track time on a race weekend, that sucks. You know, mm-hmm. you're, you're going to be back in qualifying and then something goes wrong in qualifying, you're back in the race. It's just such a snowball effect. So I think one of it, one of the big challenges is knowing how to just turn that on immediately. Uh, but then also being able to just throw mistakes away and forget they ever happened. Gotcha. You, you don't have time to dwell on anything and, and let it sort of fester and like, all right, I'm going to really dive into what happened. No, it's gone. It already happened. You can't change you it on. now. Move on to the next thing. And that even happens within a race. You make a mistake. Somebody cuts you off. Somebody, you know, whatever. doesn't matter. As soon as it's happened, it's over. 
And you have to be really good at sort of compartmentalizing those emotions and just throwing them away. I had good days at it. Yeah. I have bad days. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not gonna lie to you. There's probably yeah. some radio footage yeah. out there yeah. that I'm not proud of for my mother to hear. Yeah. It was just yeah. beep beep beep. But it's, yeah, but it's just it's such an emotional thing, yeah. right? That's what it, sport just brings that out in people. It's just so competitive. But yeah, it's massively challenging in that sense. Is it hard to manage your performance when you're like it's a team sport? You have you have a teammate, you have team expectations, but then you have your expectations. Is that hard to manage or? Is it, it just it, open communication with everyone? It can be. It really can be. And I think ultimately every driver is going to put more pressure and expectation on themselves, A, than anyone externally ever could. So like the whole out, you know outside or external pressure thing, I think is a little bit of a misnomer for a lot of drivers because we're all just so competitive. Mm. There's no news article or sponsor or whatever that can put more pressure on me that I'm going to put on myself anyway. And then also I think drivers tend to try to – at least I did, you know, we didn't try to just inadvertently would take more responsibility, right? Because you are the one in the car, you're the sort of public facing figure of the team. It could be someone else's fault or a mistake that you didn't necessarily do, but you would still, you would still kind of internalize it a little bit. It, It was tough to separate that stuff a bit. And that was one thing that I had to learn was when there was a bad result, that I knew really wasn't my doing. I had to be the driver and be like, wasn't my fault. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but when I knew I did everything I, I had to do or could do and something happened to me, some hand I was dealt limited our result to X, I had to know that I could walk away from that race and I personally could feel good yeah. about what I did and the mm. job that I did and that the result wasn't a reflection of my efforts, my preparation, my execution, because sometimes it would, right? It used to and it, it would just gnaw you. You're like, no, wait. I shouldn't do anything different next week because I didn't do anything that made that happen that way. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, it would eat away at you otherwise. It, for sure. And, and, it, and it does. And again, I've, I've been through the whole cycle of it. I've worked with mental coaches to help. And I think a lot of drivers have because it's a huge part of it. Mm. And then in 2015, I think, obviously, this was something that you've talked before about, but I want to kind of talk about, obviously, the practice session, Indy 500, suspension failure, very fatal accident. I mean, what were some of the moments leading up to that? Like, was it a blur for you? Like, we talked to drivers that have had crashes, and sometimes they're like, it was the longest time of my life, and there's sometimes where it's like, it just happened so quickly, and I couldn't actually process it. Yeah, I don't remember it. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's really easy. I was very concussed mm-hmm. in the accident, uh, which I'm super thankful for because mm-hmm. it was a pretty unpleasant experience from mm-hmm. what the medical team tells me, um, you know, removing a three foot steel rod from my body and, you know, putting me in an ambulance as I'm bleeding to death on the racetrack. Um, so I, I, I can't answer that. I, I remember crossing the start finish line at the beginning of that lap. I was following Montoya. Mm-hmm. Everything was good blink of an eye I'm laying on my back staring up bright lights I got a tube down my throat I'm in a neck brace and a lot of really concerned people standing around me and so Uh, I have to kind of put the dots together like all right Something something's happened. gone wrong oh, here. Yeah. This yeah. is not where I should be. Yeah. yeah. But uh but yeah, for me I I I don't know and I'm very thankful for that. Right. <laughs> and how do you come back from yeah, that? Yeah, what was that road yeah. to recovery like? I think because I don't know. Uh, you know what the pain was like on yeah. that day in that mm. moment. Um I have no recollection of the accident of the extraction. Sure. I remember the four months of recovery yeah. and a lot of that sucked, don't get me wrong. Mm. But what I did was there, there were two factors that really helped. First was the fact that it was a mechanical failure that caused the accident, right? So again, it wasn't something that I did wrong. Yep. So I didn't have to question my skill, my decision-making. It wasn't something that put me in that position. Complete bad luck, fluke thing. Cool. So I can let that go. One in a million thing. And then the other thing was I didn't remember the immediate aftermath and the consequence of that accident. Yeah. So in my mind, when I was you know in the hospital and recovering, I just associated everything I was going through with a car accident. In my mind, I just got into a car accident, like happens every day. Yeah. I didn't associate it with the race car. I didn't associate it with the racetrack. So as soon as I had the opportunity to get back in the car, get back on the track, I was ready to go. And you came back and you got pole, right? A year later. <laughs> yeah. A year later. That's insane. Back to the <laughs> same track. Nuts. And yeah, that was a cool moment. Yeah. That was a really cool moment just because of everything. And, you know, it was basically a year on from the accident. A lot of people coming into the month that year at Indy were like, man, how's it going to be for him? Like, is he going to be able to drive there? What's going to be like? And you got to remember like that doesn't just happen to one person, right? A race team's a family. And so like they lost a brother there for the rest of that season. And those guys all went through it with me in a lot of ways. And a lot of those same people were on my car the next year. And so to show up to Indy hundredth running of the race, like milestone event a year after that, you know, situation 
and as a group to, to build the fastest car at the speedway, to drive it faster. And like that is just, it's such an accomplishment. It's, it's such a point of pride for a race team when we go to the 500, it's just so special. Yeah. And to do it then, you know, in the manner, I mean, it was like, it was like movie script stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if we'd only won the race, it would have been like, it, yeah. would, have <laughs> it would have been an HBO show by now, but. Yes. I stopped watching, don't worry. Yeah. Yeah. Off, uh, just like, skip, you skip. won, you won. Yeah. Yeah. But it shows your mental toughness. You to be able to come back, yeah. perform, and actually push the car to the limits again. So that's that's outstanding. Kudos. No, I appreciate yeah. it. I appreciate it. It's, and, and to talk even about safety, do you think that Indy has the appropriate safety like you know, uh, in the sport, or do you think they need to do more? Honestly, I think IndyCar has been one of the leading series globally when it comes to driver safety. Um, some of the things that were developed here and really pioneered over here, or at least accepted over here, things like the Hans device happened here first, safer barriers were developed in IndyCar, uh, the amount of work that we've done with ha headrests around foam, um, any intrusion things into the car, that was also partly something that I was re <laughs> indirectly responsible for. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, obviously the, the aero screen, you know, I know the halo is now kind of globally the standard. Um, and a lot and the, the aero screen has copped a lot of flack from, from different corners of our universe and also other, you know, racing groups. But, uh, I really do think it's, it is a good product. I think it is the future. Mm -hmm. I really do think eventually all open wheel cars will end up with some solution more similar to that. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, they're just, they're kind of always thinking, even this year, we have a, a new attenuator on the back of the car, something yeah. that worked fine, but hey, we can make it better. And we've actually adjusted the headrest this year based on an accident that happened in Texas last year. So they're always thinking, they're always evolving. And that's that's what I love about it. You got to keep pushing the sport. It's the only way you can is to constantly keep in top of it. It's never going to be 100% safe. No. We know that, right? And so everything we can do to make it that little bit better, I think is just better for everyone. I mean, the safety team, that's something that IndyCar really kind of pioneered. And man, I mean, that quite literally saved my life. Yep. Not yeah. just for the sake of this conversation or sounding dramatic. Yeah. Without that, any other series, that same accident happens, I don't make it. Yeah. Just the way that that... that program is built and and the protocols they have so yeah Indy, Indy cars in a really good spot in that sense but still always pushing yeah mm -hmm. what uh what inspired you to pick up the mic like you're out here with us today <laughs> <laughs> you know what man i i got this really f interesting weird opportunity to kind of try a little bit of commentary when i was 19 mm -hmm. i was doing what was on the atlantic series which is the feeder series to what was the champ car series back in the day and there was sort of two broadcasts. There was the broadcast that everybody saw here. It was on ESPN or ABC or whatever it was. And that's what you saw if you were in Canada or the US. Then there was this international broadcast that was kind of like the redheaded stepchild of the TV world mm -hmm. in, that, in, in those times. And it was one guy did it by himself. There was like one producer and we, they took the feed from the domestic feed, but it was the international feed and it blasted out to 170 countries. Wow. Basically, unless you were in Canada, US or Mexico, you got this other feed that they almost didn't really care about because that's not where most of the audience <laughs> yeah. is, understandably. So this guy would do it by himself, and he, he was a friend of mine, Jeremy Shaw, and he would invite people into the booth to like come do a 10-minute segment, 15-minute segment, something like that. And after one of my races, you know, we would race Sunday morning before the before the big cars. I was like, why don't you come come by the booth today for the start of the race and stay for 10 minutes, whatever? I'm like, yeah, cool. So I went and did it, and you know, get there, put the headset on, Proust comes on. I was like, all right, we're live to 170 countries. Don't swear. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> the first thing you think is. <laughs> and, so, uh, and so we did it to the first commercial break, and it was a lot of fun. It was just me and my buddy just chatting about racing, which I would do any day. You do normally yeah, anyways, yeah. Right. yeah. And, uh, and then so we get the commercial, and he looks at me, and goes, do you want to stay for another one? I said, yeah, sure, why not? Mm. So I finished the race. And at the end of the race, every commercial, he's like, you want to, stay, you want to keep, going? keep going? So I stayed for the whole time. And at the end of it, he goes, what are you doing next week? And I just, every weekend for the rest of the season, when I got done with my race, I'd get changed. I'd run up to the booth and I would do these international broadcasts for Jam Car with Jeremy Shaw. No experience, no training, no right to be there whatsoever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But he was such a good teacher and such a cool guy to be around. And like I said, just talking about racing, which is like, I would do that for free. free yeah. No, I won't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, hey, hey. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. But so then I was like, man, I, I think this is a this is a direction I want to look at when I stop driving. It's, it's cliche, right? Like athlete retires and goes up in the booth, but like that was really what kind of put that in my mind. And so I've always kind of had it at the back there. Wow. Was there know. someone's career though that you were trying to also emulate? Maybe was there like somebody that you were like, oh, that transition worked really well for them? Not specifically, no, no. I mean, I know a bunch of guys have done it. I mean, Scott Goodyear was sort of doing it at the time uh, in the IndyCar side of things. Obviously, Brundle did it and is still doing it in the, in the F1 side. Rosberg's done it. DC's. Yeah 
you know, flirts with it. And yeah. uh, I'll get to work with him a bit. Eddie Cheever did it over here. I mean, Unser did it. You know, Bobby was part. So it's, it's there's always kind of been a driver, PT, Townsend Bell. Like, it's yeah. always kind of been part of it. Yeah. So there wasn't necessarily one guy that had done it that I was trying to emulate, but I just knew it was something that happens. Mm -hmm. And I had this cool opportunity to try it when I was young. So I thought I would like it. And so far, so good. Wow. Oh. So, so that's how the transition all happened, just from, from being 19 to, to start doing it like that? Yeah, pretty much. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, sorry, I've completely lost my train of thought. There. <laughs> um, you re oh, sorry, to go back, you were recently named the presenter of F1, a co-presenter. Yes, yeah. Uh, are you looking forward to that challenge? Yeah, very much so, very much so. I got the call last year to, uh, to do three of the last four races just to kind of... Uh, try something different you know i wasn't expecting that call but yeah. they reached out and um they wanted to try something that was a, frankly just a little less british you know just pulling one in person because <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, yeah. you know um you pick up the phone like hello <laughs> yeah, right, right. Well, it's funny because i have a british passport from england but like so that was like the that was like their entry level it's like well he's not british but he is but kind of british kind of, so okay, like, okay. he's one of us <laughs> he's from canada the queen's yeah. on the money so yeah. we'll, we'll take him oh, God. and uh and so it was it was awesome. And I've known Will Buxton a little bit just from his work with F1 and NBC. And he came, he's been to a couple IndyCar races over the years. So I've known Will and um, to get to work over there. Ben Edwards, who was the, the lead commentator last year on F1 TV, uh, him and I worked together when I raced A1GP. Wow. Um, and so I knew I knew a couple of the people yeah. and then got to go over there. And man, had an absolute blast. Yeah. Like a really fun group to work with. Um, you know, I've, I've followed F1 religiously my whole life. I mean, I've been a huge fan of anything motorsport. So obviously I, I uh, was happy to kind of try something different. Yeah. And yeah, it's been a lot of fun. And yeah, they, I guess it went well. They're having me back for yeah. a couple of yeah, Because so. yeah, you did good. Austin, right? You yes. covered Austin. Yes. yes. And I was, I remember, well, did you do practice? Yeah, I did. Yes. We do every session. And I was so like, it's busy, I, yeah. at that time, it, like, it, it doesn't show your name or anything. Right. So I was like, that guy knows what he's talking <laughs> about. <laughs> well, it's funny, man, because in Austin, especially, because that was my first one, I really yeah. had imposter syndrome a little bit because I've never driven those cars, mm. right? Oh. And so, like, I and you just know what people on the internet are like, oh, right? Yeah. So I'm like, oh, this, I, yeah. I had to be really careful about what I said and how yeah. I said it. So it, you know, and then luckily, that weekend was when Alex Polo was doing FP1 for McLaren. Yeah. So I also know Alex really well and Pato had just done a test day and whatever. And so as soon as he got off the track, I just sat him down. I was like, tell yeah. me everything. <laughs> 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 when this happens, what do you do? When you see this, what does that mean? I'm just like ripping off all these questions. So at least if something happens, yeah, I might kind of know yeah, what's yeah, actually yeah. happening. Yeah, yeah. Not just, you know, 94% of it is the same. It's yeah. just motorsports, right? right but there right. are definitely some unique things between F1 or IndyCar or whatever. Mm. And so that's what I was trying to pick his brain on. No, it was fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Well, that wraps up Q1. Yeah. What's the verdict, Henny? What are we feeling here? A green? Green. Green? Green, green sector? No purple? That's time. Ah, just oh, too soon, right? Just too, too soon. Time. Yeah. <laughs> Damn, not me, man. Yeah. I have to say it. But they're, they're strict, so we'll All see right. if you can get a purple in Q2. I'll try and up my game. Stay tuned, guys. Q2's coming up. Hey, guys. Hope you're enjoying this episode. We want to take a bit of time to give a big shout-out to one of our partners, AG1. And AG1, by the way, has a ton of health benefits that we want to unpack very quickly. Yeah, I honestly think AG1 is one of the best products out there. The fact that we're always on the go, mm. even with this podcast, we're constantly traveling. AG1 is so easy to use. One little scoop into a bottle of water, shake it up in your morning, drink, and it's all there. Mm. 75 probiotics, minerals. 75? Every 75. Everything you need in one little scoop. And it's gluten-free, yep. dairy-free. And allergy free. Yeah. How can it get better than that? <laughs> well, I'll tell you. Okay. I haven't been using AG1 for as long as you, Henny. Mm -hmm. I've been using it maybe for now two, three weeks. I have actually seen, as a person that has digestion issues, yeah. I've been able to break down my food way better. That's crazy. And it's no surprise. AG1 has digestive enzymes, yep. the probiotics you mentioned. It helps with digestion. Yep. Not only that, because I'm digesting my food properly, <laughs> I'm also sleeping better. Yes. And because I'm sleeping better, I'm actually seeing my skin. Mm. It's smoother. It's glowing. Glowing, less acne, less yep. heat rashes. Yep. Overall, loving my experience with AG1. If you want to take ownership of your health, try AG1 now and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash track limits. That is drinkag1.com slash track limits. Hey guys, welcome back to the Track Limits Podcast. We're here with Hinch. Also heard nicknames, by the way. Oh no. Hinch huh. is a nickname. Hinchtown, we heard, is also a nickname. Okay. Yeah. 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 That, where that where did that come tracks. about? 
so that was that was like my um, that was my website, right? So when you're, you know, I was a young driver way back when, <laughs> and the, this thing called the internet was yeah. really starting to pick up. Uh, okay, and so you had to have a website, right? right? And so everyone was, you know, drivers first and last name dot com, driver first and last name racing dot com, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and I mean even even F one guys, NASCAR, IndyCar, it was very new. Like website, personal websites were very new, and so we like I sat with this guy and we were like, all right, we got to come up with an idea for a website. Let's look at all these websites. So we looked at them all all the top drivers, and we came to two conclusions. They were all exactly the same, and they all sucked. Yeah. <laughs> and so, like, let's just do something totally different. Yeah. And so it. we created this, like, internet town, this, like, mythical town that I was the self-proclaimed mayor of. <laughs> so I became the mayor of Hinchtown, and Hinchtown.com oh was my website. <laughs> let's Hinchtown go. was all my social media handles mm-hmm. when that started becoming a mm-hmm. thing. And so, yeah, people just call me Hinchtown or call me the mayor. You know, wow, it's just class. It's just sort of, it caught on. Yeah. Like, we didn't really know yeah. what we were doing. I mean, it was a long time Is ago. Is the website but, still live? Yeah, it's still still live. We got to oh revamp it now and yeah. kind of gear it more towards the TV stuff. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, all my all my social handles are hinged down. It's wow. just kind of a video game. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Video game, you know? Literally, you're showing like the metaverse. Be like, yeah, I created this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm the mayor. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I love it. Well, let's get into Q2 and Q2 again. We want to go more into personal questions, okay. understanding you as a professional. Why don't you just walk us back all the way? When did you first remember, hey, I actually want to make motorsports a career? Like, did Man. you have any other career path that you were going down and then you were like, oh, maybe this one? No. No. No, I, I didn't have time for that. I was too focused on, on racing. And I mean, w- what's funny is when I, I, so I started racing at nine, I got a go-kart. That's, you know, and I'd been a fan long before that. My first memories of life were watching races with dad. You know, the IndyCar came to Toronto. I'm from just outside the city. So I think I went to the second ever race in Toronto and I've been to every one since. And so I just, I just had a passion for it. Dad had a passion for it. I got an older brother, older sister, and neither one of them cared. The third time was a charm. He got his race <laughs> fan, like, yes. you know, the third kid, yeah. <laughs> and so I ended up getting a go-kart for my ninth birthday, and it was really just something fun to do with Dad. It was just a hobby. At nine, I'm, I'm like, that's not a real job, mm-hmm. you know. But then at about 14, you know, you moved up the ranks as you get older and whatever, and every time I moved up, I seemed to do better, and I enjoyed it more, and I just kind of got more into it. And so, yeah, at about 14, someone came to us like, hey, you should start thinking about this, you know, a little more seriously, race in the karting league where it's all the young drivers that are trying to be professionals and see how it, how it goes. Mm-hmm. So I started doing that at 14, ended up uh, moving into cars at 16, got a scholarship from BMW to race the Formula BMW championship back when that was a thing uh, when I was 17 mm-hmm. and just kind of yeah. took off from there. Did you ever kart at Goodwood, by the way? It's my home track. Oh, oh like, we did it last summer. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I grew yeah. up a good one, and it's it's now owned and operated by brothers who I used to race against, the DeLeos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. So Marco, he's my age, or age enough that we always race together, and then Dan was a couple years older. But yeah, yeah I, I, I that's that's my home. That's yeah. where I started, we did, Yeah, we did the card series, and yeah. he just kept whipping our yeah. asses. Yeah, <laughs> so much fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were doing a really good. Yeah. yeah, they're doing it really they well great organized. Yeah. Especially for like the drive, uh, what's it called? Arrive to Arrive. drive. Arrive to drive. Especially yeah. for us, we just wanted to get into it. Yeah. No gear, and it's perfect. Yeah, it was yeah. fantastic. Where are you guys based? In Toronto. 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 All Toronto. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Amazing. That's why we're so excited. It's like fellow Canadians tonight. It's incredible. And then when it comes to your career, I mean, you mentioned also in Q1, there were times where you were like sitting down and being like, okay, a mistake was made. But again, you know, it's hard to dissociate. But there were times obviously where the team might have made a mistake. When you make a mistake, and I bet you've made a ton, right? Just like any other professional. Mm -hmm. How do you bounce back? What is your regimen to be like, you know what? Let's get over it, but learn from it at the same time. Well, and that's just it. I think the first thing is you try to establish what can I learn from this? You know, if I were to do it over again, what would I have done differently? And that's uh, that kind of analytical approach is that's how I go through. That's my life. It's my personality, right? Like there are some drivers that are just like the pure natural feel kind of people. There are the slightly more analytical people. I'm in the second camp. Uh, I love pouring over data. I love looking, learning, applying that on the racetrack. Mm-hmm. And so I would take that same sort of approach. Like, okay, here's what happened. If I were to find myself in this situation again, what would I do differently? What do I think that outcome would be? And then you just try to program it into your head because you don't have time to think out there, right? Most of these situations are so just muscle, muscle memory and reflex. And so it really is just a, you know, a, a process of trying to get these these ideas sort of just just drilled into your brain that, hey, if I find myself in this situation, this is how I'm going to react to it. 
and then you just, you got to let the disappointment just roll off your back because yeah. <laughs> it can it can eat away at you like yeah. you said and and in terms of traveling i know you guys travel even as a racer and now as a presenter how do you deal with that balance of just you know constantly being like oh i'm on a flight next week and yeah. then it's another half across the world yeah. how do you guys deal with that well look i mean it i really don't want to i would have complained a, a lot more about yeah. this before yeah. i worked with anybody in the f1 world yeah. because <laughs> that schedule is actually no, mess you're awesome. like here and then there and it then shouldn't then. be yeah. it should yeah. be legal yeah. it should be like a human rights violation yeah. Yeah. Increasing the races to to, now too. It's yeah. madness. It's absolutely yeah. mad. But that's a totally. That's an yeah. entire different podcast. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so it, it is a huge challenge. Uh, we're lucky that we don't have a, a massive swing in time zones. You know, that's three true. hours. That's the, that's the most you're going to have. Um, but what you know, what a lot of drivers do is they have a, a motorhome, a bus, right, that goes to all the races. And so at least when you get there, you have something that's familiar. You have a bed you know. You have all the stuff you need, some creature comforts that can just help you stay in that mode, right? And so that was all part of, like, the mental preparation as well. You knew that when I went to bed in, that, in this bed, I was waking up the next morning to drive a race car. Mm. And it, it starts that it starts 12 hours before you ever get in the car. And, and so that's a big part of it, I think, is just having that sort of familiar space at the track. Um, you know, if you have to get out somewhere a little bit early, if you want to adjust to the time zones, you know, that's very popular. You do there, go there, do a day or two of training, just kind of get the body used to it. Um, you know, we used to race in Mexico City, high elevation. You'd want to go you know, a little bit earlier and, you know, get your- Adjust to it. Right. So things like that. But I think uh, I think that procedure of having that same spot to go to was, was a big part of it. And do you see Indy cars ever expanding into- other parts of the world? I hope so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we Is used to. Is there talks to that? Is there talks to that? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Oh, oh. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, it's a topic that comes up a lot because we used to race all over. I mean, we used to race in Japan. We used to mm. race in Australia and Brazil and yeah. the UK and, and other parts of Europe. And um, well, we would love to, man. I mean, we've, we've got the one race in Canada, obviously. Okay. I'd love another one at least in Canada. Yeah. Vancouver. Um, <laughs> Vancouver. Oh, that, that one was so good back in the day, but I don't think we can do that one anymore. Yeah. I mean, Montreal would be great. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful that's track. Just yeah, we there. already have it. We yeah. have a city that's <laughs> mad about motorsports. Let's... What, yeah. are we, what are we doing, guys? Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Can we Maybe. make that happen? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, you've got a very successful, popular Mexican driver. Mm -hmm. well, a bunch of nice tracks in Mexico, but love to go there. Um, but yeah, there, there are some talks of, of going other places. I think I think it was important. Look, IndyCar went through a rough patch, right? Like after the merge, 2008, like everything sucked and yeah. it was just tough. It's it's taken a bit to get there. It's in a good spot. Everything's you know trending upwards. All the trajectories are going the right way. Now I think it's a good time to really start looking at that expanding. I think motorsports globally is getting more popular, and so that's going to open up. I, ho I hope some opportunities for you know other series, Easy. not just the one that goes everywhere. <laughs> um, so yeah, hopefully that's that's something on the horizon. The documentaries like um, like Netflix did and all that they're really pushing the at least pushing it to the fans out there to get more viewership. Um, from a driver now going to a broadcaster, how are you doing your research preparation? Is it easier because you know the tracks, you know the drivers? Or like, are you calling the engineers to get all the, the latest and greatest? It's Gallus? both, yeah. honestly. Um, yeah, I'm lucky. I've got a lot of great relationships in the paddock, right? Whether it's with drivers, mechanics, engineers, whatever. So I have a natural sort of relationship with a lot of the, the guys I raced against. I talked to them. I talked to a bunch of them on a regular basis anyway. So some of that stuff you just sort of pick up through osmosis, being around and whatever. Then on a race weekend itself, there's a couple engineers that I worked with over the past that I'll make sure I hit up with specific questions about like, all right, what are we looking at for fuel mileage this weekend? Like, what are the windows? What's changed? What hasn't? Um, you know, you'll get the the graphs with all the top speeds for the different straightaways. So that way, when you're doing the commentating stuff, you know, like, yeah, hey, he's heading into this corner at this yeah. many miles yeah. an hour. And, and you're right. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I could eyeball it and probably come within 10, you know, plus or minus. But like, I'd rather have the actual information. So it's kind of a combination of all those things. Good. Yeah. And um, in, in, in terms of just even just, you know, understanding the data that like what they give you, how do you translate that into making it, you know, just a presenting right. like, to, to, so that people can understand it? Right. It's, it's funny, man. So I always used to really love meeting people that knew very little about racing yep. because within a 10 minute conversation, you, t you would teach them something that they didn't know. And like, that's really cool. Yeah. I didn't know if I'd known that, I'd be paying, I'm going to pay attention next exactly. time. Or I'm going to watch out for that next yeah. time. It makes the race itself more exciting. Mm -hmm. And so I must have just kind of naturally had practice having those types of conversations yeah. with people because now that's essentially my role in, in the commentary box, right, is mm -hmm. taking what's happening on track from the driver's standpoint, but making it understandable to people who have never done what these drivers are doing. Mm -hmm. And and it's, yeah, it's it's trying to think about 
relating it to everyday things that anyone has experienced or everyone has experienced, um, which can be more challenging, more challenging in certain situations than others. But that's basically the, the what, what you got to do is is I, there's no kind of rhyme or reason for how to do it. I just I don't know. I just start talking and it, yeah. Yeah, it, it works, works out. <laughs> it works yeah. out pretty well. And when you yeah. prepare, do you, however, like star certain things that are like, oh, this might be a little bit too complicated, too technical. Like, how do you balance that need for like engaging and entertaining viewers by also providing like insightful nuggets? For sure, it's know? that's tough because yeah. I'm you know I'm a I'm a fan of the sport. I'm a nerd. Like I'm a yeah. tech guy. I love all the intricacies of everything, whether it's the car itself, the strategies, whatever. Big stats guy. Like we get a big stats page before each uh, each race. It's probably 12, 15 pages long. You read all of it? I read the whole thing. Oh, yeah. all, the, all the teams, all the drivers. All the teams, all the drivers, all the stats on the track, on the race, previous races, the, the previous like everything that's done in the season so far, like everything. Um, and, I, and I read it through. I make my own notes, and you know I have that all with me up up in the booth just in case I need to reference anything. Um, but um, sorry, I, I, I was going somewhere balancing like, that. like right, yeah, right, yeah. Yeah. So a great example is you know we did the Rolex twenty four this year and the new GTP cars came out massively complicated machines all this new battery hybrid technology whatever and we spent hours and hours and hours talking to team owners and people from whether it was Honda or GM or Porsche or whatever learning about these cars this that and the other and then we all kind of sat there before the race and we were like. None of that matters. Like we just spend ninety percent of our time preparing for five percent of what we're going to talk about. Yeah. But we were just we're all racing nerds, yeah. right? So we just got deep in. We're like, okay, can't say that. Can't yeah. say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't say that. So like, the golden rule is: Would my mom understand this? That's a good one, right? Because yeah. my mom, you know, she's been around racing, so she knows maybe more than like someone that's never watched a race, right? But she's not like the newest generation up on all this stuff. You know, she's not like a car person necessarily. And so I'm like, hey, if mom understands what I'm saying here, I'm probably reaching most of the audience. Yeah. 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 And uh, for someone that's an F1 fan trying to start getting into indie, what's that one thing you will tell them to convince them like you need to watch indie? You don't know who's going to win. I don't mean to be selling a fucking record, but like, you know, F1 is so fascinating in so many ways. Yeah. And it's the pinnacle of motorsports, the pinnacle of technology. It's all these things that they advertise it to be. Yeah. But what it's not is unpredictable or sometimes particularly exciting. Yeah. And that's someone who's, a, I can say that as a huge fan of the sport. IndyCar is just, it's different in that sense, right? You don't have that big disparity between teams. The, the gaps are so small. The racing is a little less predictable. You could argue it's less pure because we have more safety cars or close pits under yellow or whatever. It doesn't matter. The, the rules are made in a way to keep it fair and competitive, but also yep. entertaining. We're a sport. Yep. You know, we are entertainment. And so, uh, yeah, if, if, I, if you like F1, I just don't see how you can't. If you like actually <laughs> racing, racing? Yeah, and not yeah, just yeah. drive to survive because yeah. that's different. Yeah. If you like drama, yeah. all right, fine. Maybe yeah. 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 Not, you're not, not even you. watching F1 races. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, you're not, you're not yeah. who I'm talking to. Yeah. Yeah. But if you enjoy what you're seeing on track, you yeah. will love this just as much. It's probably going to be like the first weekend in Bahrain because everyone like you only got two days of testing. You don't know who's who's going to perform, who's not. Our Mercedes sandbag and have McLaren yeah. get more up their sleeve. So I do what you mean. I know what you mean by. And we also had like an engineer, an indie engineer, tell us like they may that their job is even more rewarding because they know that like if they actually put on a really good upgrade, it could actually take them from like a midfield team to the front for sure. Even if it's like a point two, point three, huge benefit. Can you give me three tenths of a second. Yeah. In yeah. Oh my god. Oh my we're, god. We're flying. Yeah. You are the the highest paid engineer in the car overnight. Okay, maybe not point two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, a couple, a couple, like yeah. you, you go to some of these ovals, right? The Indianapolis 500. The margins you're talking about at, at the yeah. speedway are so small, man. We we make this joke, right? We so at the speedway they normally do um, like the speed charts are, are on speed, not lap time, right? For the ovals they switch it over to average speed. And so you'll get to Indy and you'll unload and do the first practice session and you're a mile an hour off. You know, you're, you're running a 226 and this guy's running a 227 and you're sitting there on your timing stand kicking stuff and throwing things. You're <laughs> like, where are we going to find a mile an hour? Like it feels like the most insane, like just insurmountable gap, right? Mountain to climb. On a stopwatch... A mile an hour average around the speedway is like three hundredths of a second. Yeah, it's you nice. know, it's something. It's, same, it's a blink. And we're sitting here like, oh, our months over. Yeah, yeah, Why are yeah, we yeah, even yeah, here? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just crazy how close yeah. and how fine it is. Yeah. And and what advice would you give an up and coming driver, whether it's Indy, F one, Formula racing, and what the like specific uh, recommendation? 
it, it's honestly, it's, it sounds kind of cliche because it is, but it, cliches exist for a reason. It's because th it's enough sad. people yeah. have come yeah. to the same conclusion. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's hard work. It's mm -hmm. persistence. It's hard work. It's no different than any other sport, right? Um, in the sense of the work ethic you have to have to push yourself to always be improving physically, mentally, from any skill set point of view, you've got to be 100% committed to this particular job. The challenge in racing is the opportunities are so few, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There are only X number of seats. You know, compare it to you know, basketball, I was about 800, 1,000 guys yep. in the league, whatever. There's 27 here. Mm -hmm. There's 20 in F1. Mm -hmm. Like, we are all fighting over. So there are times when your circumstances just aren't in your favor, but it's the ones that don't give up that eventually that's going to come back. I didn't debut in IndyCar until I was 24. Mm -hmm. At the time, that wasn't like that old, but it wasn't on the younger side. Yep. Nowadays, there's like six guys that are 21 or under, I think. Mm -hmm. Like, it's insane. Getting younger and younger. It's just getting younger and younger. So, the, But then I look at a guy like Nick DeVries in F1. He's making mm -hmm. his debut at 28. 28 yeah. Look at uh, Canapino here. He's making his debut at 32, mm -hmm. right? So you just you cannot give up. The opportunities aren't always there when they should be or when you want them to be, but the ones that just stay at it, stay persistent, don't give up and don't think, oh, my, my time's passed, eventually that door will open. Do you ever get the itch to get behind the steering wheel again? Yeah. yeah. Are we going to see that? Well, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. Well, come on. Come on. Tell us. Tell I, I, we'll see. We'll see. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not done. I'll put okay. it that way. I'm not done done, but we'll see. Yeah. I know. Can you yeah. imagine? It's like two races yeah. goes by, and he's like, "I'm back." James in. is back. <laughs> <laughs> Final question: Tell us a bit about who you are outside of work, outside of racing. You know, who is James Hinchcliffe? Like, what do you like to do? Do you go back to Toronto often? Like, tell us a bit about your personal. Yeah, so I'm a I'm a simple guy, man. I um, I'm a lighthearted person. I always try to bring that energy to the racetrack too. I, I had a lot of friends that I raced with that were such different people at the track and away from the track, which I get. That's you know, some people have to be in a certain mindset, whatever. I was always a better driver when I felt just good and free and loose. So I, I'm a goof. I'm a, I'm a goof at the track. I'm a goof at home. My wife will tell you. Um, my wife and I love to travel. I mean, now that I don't have the responsibilities of a driver, I have a lot more free time than I have for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. So like last year was a lot of fun. We did a lot of things that I'd never get to do in, in a summer or, you know, during season, things like that. We love our dogs. We walk our dogs a lot. Uh, you know, my wife's an actress. We love going to movies, watching movies. Um, yeah, so travel, movies, dogs, being outside. We go we go to Toronto as much as we can. You know, our family's in Oakville. Um, we've got a cottage up in Muskoka. We try to get up there whenever we can, which is nowhere near enough. Because yeah. <laughs> as you know, like peak time in Muskoka, also peak time to be yeah, working yeah, somewhere yeah, else. Yeah, so yeah, that's yeah, the yeah, one yeah, thing yeah, I really yeah. haven't been able to add too no. much more yeah, to. Yeah. Because it's still just a whole process get up there, and I'm gone every weekend in the summer. But uh, yeah, man, just we're just simple people that love you know love living life because. My life was so solely focused on one thing for so long. Now I'm I've got these opportunities to try these things and do more, and so I, we're just really embracing it. Fantastic. Well, Amazing. what are we gonna rank that, guys? Come on. That was good. That was that good. Was good. Yeah. yeah, that was good. <laughs> I, think, I like that. I think we could go Gerpel. You know, Gerpel. Gerpel. Yeah. It's a half. Right. You know, that's right. Yeah. 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 Right. yeah, yeah. Let's do it. There's still potential for poll here. Oh yeah. Q yeah. three is coming Q3. up. Rapid that's fire it. round. Right. We're gonna see if Gavin can get a. Uh, sorry, not Gavin. Oh my oh, God. Oh no. The James. My bad. The other Canadians. We'll see if Hitch can get a purple here. Stay tuned. Boom. All right, welcome back to the Track Limits podcast. We are here with the Hinch himself, and we're going to get into the rapid fire round now. James, are you nervous? Very. Yeah. <laughs> I don't like this. Have you done rapid fires before? Yeah, yeah. certainly. But I mean, this one seems more serious. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Was two, yeah. three <laughs> poles on the line. Game 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 game. Yeah, Come absolutely. On. He's got to oh. bring the A zone in. I'm glad you recognize this moment yeah. and how yeah. important it is. Perfect. First question. If you had to choose one platform to post on forever, which one would it be? Uh, Instagram. Yes. Which one out of the bigger platforms would you delete? Mm. Facebook. Yes or no? Have you Googled yourself? <laughs> and how often? <laughs> yes, at some point. Not... Not for a very long time. Okay. Not for a very long time. Okay. What car do you drive daily on the road? Uh, a Honda Pilot. Hey. Yeah. Uh, I'm about to show you a photo. Oh. This is, <laughs> for audio listeners. This could this be is, so many things. Yeah, oh, this yeah. is a photo of you with Dancing with the Stars. Yep. Uh, what was happening here? <laughs> well, that was me being the Joker okay. and my partner being Harley Quinn for the Halloween dance. Oh, man. Which I'm happy to report we got perfect tens on. Woo! Nice. So well, it was go. worth putting on the makeup. Oh. I love it. I love How long it. did that take? A long time. <laughs> Getting it off actually was, yeah. was longer. That, oh that, they used like the industrial strength stuff on that show, oh, right? Because oh, yeah. they don't want you like sweating yeah, it off yeah, from yeah. TV. It took a while to get that. Wow. Uh, one track to race on forever. Road America. 
Racing in the wet or racing in the dry? Which Race, condition do you prefer? Racing in the dry. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. What's the most over-asked question that you get? <laughs> <laughs> Does it hurt when you crash? Oh. oh okay. And you're like, I can't remember. I don't remember. <laughs> yeah. You know, it tickles. Yeah. yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It feels great, guys. <laughs> it's a groove. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, <laughs> funniest moment while you're presenting? While we're presenting? Yeah. Um, so <laughs> uh, last year at, I want to say it was Barber, it was raining, and Townsend decided to, he wanted to come up with some sort of analogy to make make people at home understand, understand. the difference between driving and the, and the grip level. Yeah. And he did it using one of those granola bars that was covered in chocolate on the bottom. <laughs> oh, oh but strawberry God. or whatever at the top? Well, no, it was, it was like granola on the top yeah. and, and then chocolate. So it was like, it was yeah, like yeah. grainy oh, yeah, and yeah. aggregate on one side, but then smooth <laughs> on the other. And he started pouring water on it. Oh, God. And, and Diff was having to touch it. And oh, it was... <laughs> It was very. I mean, I think some people got it. Yeah. Some people didn't, but it was it was unique. You guys did pretty prep funny, this, right? Was this impromptu? Or? He mentioned that he had a granola bar oh and God. that he wa- he had something he wanted to do, but we weren't fully aware of where he was going with it. But hey, I think it, uh, Twitter liked it. So okay, there you go. Imagine okay. just chewing it in and being like, "Is this a granola bar?" Yeah, yeah. yeah. we explain it. It's probably like so. Then, then he t- at, when he was done, he took a bite of it. Oh, yeah. Back, yeah. back to you, Lee. <laughs> it, was, it was hard not to laugh on that one. Oh Mason, what celebrity would be a good fit for Formula One as a driver as a driver yeah none of them Any, none of them no um th- there's not like a super great correlation between actors becoming drivers mm. uh the late great paul newman was probably the best example mm. many have tried um i don't know who who seems like or to even play as a driver who do you think would be a great actor to play if there was an f1 movie well, there is, there's one there's coming, one coming yeah, up. Yeah. They're, they're casting it right now. <laughs> oh, the driver alongside go. Brad Pitt. I wonder who Lewis is thinking about. Yeah. Um, man, that's a great question. So it would be... Uh, no, he's too old. Back in the day, I would have said Ed Norton. Like Ed Norton 15 years ago, mm. I would have said Ed Norton. Today, well, that's a tough one, man. I'm, we got Tom people Cruise, like Tom Cruise. Yeah, Tom Cruise is a big one. He's also no, he's too, a, an he's too old. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm, I, the thing is, I'm going to walk out. I, I, did, I already told you as a movie guy, I'm going to walk yeah, out of here yeah, and be like, like, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the problem is my mind's defaulting to people I know drive. Right? Yeah, so yeah, Nicholas yeah. Holt yeah. and like Fastbender and guys like mm-hmm. that. But oh, yeah, Fastbender, yeah, Fastbender yeah. actually would be a great one. Yeah, too, yeah. he could be good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, there you go. Doing. We'll take that. If you had one superpower, what would it be? Probably flying. Nice. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Hey, travels. Like, yeah, travels, travels quick and easy, and I love the freedom. I think it'd be yeah. fun. Cool. Yeah. Uh, what piece of racing memorabilia would you like to own or currently own? Well, yeah. So I, I mean, so Greg Moore was my hero, and I've got a bunch of Greg stuff, and I have a Greg helmet, which is like my pride and joy. It's like the 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 piece de resistance of my collection. Um, but if I were to if I were to have free reign over anything, uh, I would you know Greg had signed with Penske before he was killed in Fontana, and uh, he had two Penske helmets done up. Uh, to my knowledge, one of them is in the Penske Museum, and one of them is uh, in BC in the in the museum collection of Greg's. There, I wouldn't want either of those guys. Yeah. But if there was a yeah. third one floating yeah. around, it'd be really cool to have one of those. Yeah, we, so we can steal it. It's yeah, okay. well, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> those people deserve them, but yeah, yeah. 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 something like that okay. would be something. Something Greg related would be cool. Something else. I got most things. Who's the greatest driver of all time, in your opinion? <sighs> Like of anything, like ever? Yeah, any circuit, any series. Uh, Mario, I think. Mario. Yeah. I think. I think Mario. <laughs> if you really break it down, <laughs> Mario Andretti has to be the yeah. goat yeah. because yeah. what he raced, the era he raced, how many different things he raced, yeah. wanted yeah. it all. Yeah. And the guy is still wheeling a yeah. two-seater Indy car Stoke at one. ten tenths yeah. with passengers in the back, eight to ten weekends a year. Yep. Like. Guy's un- he's unstoppable. I'd say Mario. Just based on your previous answers, I actually thought initially you were saying Same. Super Mario. That's why we, yeah. we, 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 we were like, wait, what? Like, because I'm like, any circuit, any circuit, yeah. you say Mario? I could tell when you folded <laughs> yeah. over, I was like, he's no, got this. No, no, no. Oh, and I was like, oh, Mario so and Dreddy, that and makes I was sense. Like, like, everybody Mario. knows you go with Yoshi <laughs> in Mario. That's insane. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> uh, what's, what's the most embarrassing moment you had at a Grand Prix weekend? So, I mean... It was kind of in, well, yeah, I guess, yeah, this counts. So yeah. I had to, I peed myself in the car once, okay. right? It was the one time I did it in my entire career, yeah. but it was sort of, it shouldn't have happened. We, it was, we were driving, it was raining. Yeah. 
we were we were red flagged. I had to go so bad. They wouldn't let me get out of the car. Like, no, we're going to start going again. Oh, no. I'm like, no, you're not. It's raining harder than when you red flagged it. Let me out of the car. They're like, no, can't get out of the car. If you get out of the car, you're out of the race. So I had to sit there. Then they're like, all right, fire the cars up. We're going. And I was, I'm like, no, there's, this is, okay, fine. Yeah. So start driving. And I'm holding it in. And I'm in agony. Oh, I'm in damn. Agony. And I was like, I was always driving along in the wet behind the safety car <laughs> and like my foot shaking. Cause I'm in like, I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The bladder and I like you know, blip the throttle and nearly spun the thing out. Yeah, and I was yeah. like, I'm going to crash. I'm yeah. going to crash. Cause I have to pee. He's like, I got to do it. I just have to do it. And so under caution for like, it took me a full lap. It's the hardest thing to do. <laughs> yeah. It's like the oh, mental God. barrier you have to break yeah. to do that. Yeah. So I, I'm like, all right, got it out. Now we're ready to go racing. And yeah. then they come on the radio. All right, we're going to red flag. You guys can hop out of the cars. Oh, and I'm like, God. God. <laughs> <laughs> but so it was on the radio, this whole exchange back and forth. So I get out of the car. Kevin Lee, my now colleague in NBC, he's like, so I heard an interesting radio transmission. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yeah, man. Yeah. I don't know what to tell you. You're talking to a guy that just wet himself. Yeah. But uh, I let to go change my suit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, upcoming predictions for Indy. And then give me your uh, take on F1. The, we talked about it. You can't predict yeah. Indy. I Man. just don't know how to do it, honestly. there I, I never would have thought in 22, last year's champion, Alex Blow, would have been six in the championship and one win on the card. Like, I, you just don't know. Joseph's always a good bet. Scott's always a good bet. Um, Alex would come back. I mean, Marcus had a breakthrough year last yep. year. Scott McLaughlin, if he continues his trajectory, he's going to be like negative one in the championship. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he's going to be so good. Yeah. You just, you just don't know. Do uh, it's, it's honestly, it's way too hard. I couldn't even tell you a team. It's, mm-hmm. uh, that's what's so fun. Like, literally every that's weekend, crazy, like, yeah. all right, how do we do it? Um, yeah. F1, Red Bull, Ferrari, Mercedes. So yeah. that's, that's the that difference. Was quick. Yeah, that was everybody quick. at home, yeah. that's yeah. the difference. Yeah. It was a really funny graphic that was put out from the F1 TV people. And after testing in Bahrain, everyone's like, all right, give your prediction of where you think the, 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 the mm. car speeds are through all 10. And I think the first four for all like six presenters was the, the same. same. Wow. Yeah. It was Red Bull, yeah. Ferrari, Mercedes, Alpine. It was, it was Alpine. the medium pack that they tried to Yeah, adjust. it was a little bit, yeah. but like, you know, McLaren was ninth or 10th on everybody's and like I mean, maybe alpha was one up or down from alpha tower or something but yeah the top four were the same for everybody and you know what they're probably right yeah mm-hmm. yeah all right fair enough last question you're writing an autobiography on your life okay and you have to pick one of these titles that best resonates with you oh okay you're right you're okay. give me one yeah 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 damn I'm like, like, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the dream catcher as yeah. a title okay hardest worker okay free spirit okay or the daredevil or Hinchtown. Ah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Hinchtown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that yeah, yeah. Option. Or the mayor, you know. <laughs> That's tough, man. I feel like at different points in my career, I've, I've been all of those things. Um, I, I'd, I'd go with Hardest Worker, honestly. Uh, that is that is what, you know, I think got me to where I was. I had, like, a lot of ups and downs, a lot of times where I thought I was done, but we just didn't give up, and, and it sort of worked out. So I'll, I'll go with that one. Fantastic. Final question we ask every guest. You know, at the very beginning, you summarized your career in about 30 seconds. How do you want to be remembered in 30 seconds? What sort of legacy do you want to leave behind? You know, it's funny. So a lot of a lot of people ask, like, what are your career goals, right? And I always really stayed away very intentionally from any sort of quantitative goals because, as we talked about earlier, so much is out of your control, right? Mistakes can be made that aren't yours or circumstances that aren't yours. So my whole thing was always, I just want to leave this sport with the respect of the people that I respect in it mm-hmm. and so whether that's as a driver as a as a commentator as an ambassador for indycar for motorsports in general if i can check those boxes in each of the that box in each of those categories that's that's good enough for me man purple that is a purple, purple. yeah perfect that <laughs> is a straight purple <laughs> just that whole that answer yeah. was yeah. a purple that's that good cool. there that's you good. go we're in the we're in the hunt there and on go. pull <laughs> for tomorrow yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> all right thanks so much hinge really appreciate it you. guys if you enjoyed this episode feel free to leave a review go and check our other episodes out on tracklimitspod.com give us a follow on social media Give James a follow too. Where can people find you? At Hinchtown. There there you you go. Go. That's it. Doesn't matter Love where it. you're looking. Yep. Give him a follow. Super exciting yep. person. And we'll see you guys in the next episode. <laughs> <laughs>